Okay, welcome to video four in our series of tutorials about producing a progressive house music track. And uh, if you haven't seen the first three videos in this series, you may want to go back and watch them first before you check this video out. It'll put everything in context and make a lot more sense. The first video, I'm going to put a link down here at the bottom of the screen, uh, which you can only see if you're not on a mobile device right now, unfortunately. So if you are on a mobile, mobile device and you want to go back and see that first video, look in the description underneath the video instead. Anyway, that first video that I'm linking to now uh, talks about a general overview of the scope of this entire project, talks about the technological requirements. Uh, we're using Ableton 9.5, you can use Mac or PC, uh, what we have for plugins, stuff like that. Anyway, videos two, three, and four are a little bit more detail, uh, going into specific parts of each track. So two was all the drum sections, three was the bass, piano stabs, and the guitar. This video, number four, we thought would be the last in the series, it's not quite. Um, but this is going to cover chords and melody, pads, vocals, and effects. And so all that will leave for the last video, number five, is going to be the uh, overview of the sends returns and looking at the master track processing that we did, because that's pretty important. And that'll be a shorter video, thankfully. So anyway, we're about to talk about the chords, melody, pads, vocals, effects. My name's Jonathan Clark, also known as DJ Bolivia, and I'm working with Francis Cormier, also known as Urban Francis. So let's get right into it and take a, take a look at the chords first. Looking at the chords and melody group folder, uh, we've got quite a bit happening here. Now you can see that within the group uh, there's nothing happening at all on this track, so I'm just going to hide that away. Let's zoom out a little bit, get this in more context. And right now we have a track called Chords, and so let's just solo a little bit of that one. And you can hear that's really got a saturated sound, upper registers, uh, warmth, distorted, saturated. Okay, and then moving down to the next section, we have this... Oh, oh, actually, maybe let's talk about the automation in each as we go. Uh, this one is automated on the audio effect rack, which Fran is going to talk about, on Macro 1. And that's basically... Um, that's the majority of the automation. Looking at the mixer, we have a little bit of a dotted eighth uh, delay echo happening towards the very end of each of those two sections, and that's it. We don't even have any volume automation on that track. Okay, looking at the next track called Strings, we'll do a quick preview of that. Okay, and for automation there, the only automation is on the mixer, and the automation lanes, there's three. We've got some, again, some delay turning on and off frequently, cycling as you go through the, through the track. Uh, and then on a reverb, we don't have a whole lot happening with that reverb. You can see, because the lane's at the very bottom, it's turned off most of the time, except for this very sharp section. And you can't really hear a whole lot happening with that. And then finally, also on that one, we have track volume. And it's going up and down quite a bit, uh, cutting in and out, depending on what else is happening elsewhere in the song. And so I had that fade out there to emulate an echo kind of going off into the distance. And then finally, our pluck track is, uh, we'll solo that and see what that sounds like. Okay, so that's kind of a cool sound. Now, the interesting thing about the pluck is that there is so much going on here during this breakdown. And there's a reason for that. When we started building this track, 
basically the intent was, we, we started off making this as an instrumental track for the tutorial. And at the last minute, just before we started filming, we thought, well, maybe it would be useful to have some vocals in there uh, just to show a little bit about what can be done with them and to give you something to experiment with. But we didn't have uh, the time or a proper vocalist to go through and do, uh, you know, we didn't want to write lyrics and, and come up with all kinds of, of proper singing for this track. So what we did was I took my laptop and microphone over to a friend's place, Kelly, and so she did some vocal recordings. And so those are in the place, they've been placed into the track during the break. And because of that, there was a little bit of overlap with her voice and with this pluck track. And so I thought that was a bit of a problem and I wanted each of them to stand out more. So the reason why all this automation is here, so much automation, five different lanes, is because I was trying to cut, carve out pieces of the pluck to make space for Kelly's vocals. And so essentially what's happening is I'm dropping frequencies out, filtering some frequencies out or equalizing them out. And I'm also playing with the gain and dropping the levels down. So if all these automation lanes weren't here, then this section through here would sound exactly like this. But because of all that work I've done, it sounds like this instead. So not a whole lot of difference coming through on the camera, I bet, but when you listen to it, you know, in a good set of speakers, there's a huge difference. This stuff sounds very dainty. It's very, um, it's been backed off so that there's not a whole lot of, uh, of the frequencies and the volume from this overlapping with the vocals that are further down below, which we'll talk about more once we get to the vocal area. But anyway, that's basically how the, um, how each of the different chords and melody sections are placed together. So let's solo the group of all three as a whole and nothing else playing in the song. And just to give you an idea, as the song progresses, what's happening. So during the intro, it's just the pluck. Then coming up into the first breakdown, we have the strings added to the pluck. Then moving into part A, which is a little bit more high energy, we've gotten rid of the pluck temporarily and added the chords. Then in the breakdown, again, a lot of stuff kind of carved out of the pluck and the strings, uh, to a smaller extent, the same sort of approach with the strings. So it's very, very subtle, leaving room for the vocals. Then we get into the main highest energy part of the song and we have just the chords. And the reason for that is there's so much other stuff happening up here with the, um, with the piano stabs and the guitars that we didn't need a whole lot of the uh, chords and melody stuff. And then once we get back to the intro and everything's fading out, well, all this high energy stuff we got rid of and we went back to strings and pluck. So that's basically what is happening with all of the chords of melody. And I'll let Fran just quickly talk about um, any effects that are happening in here. And, uh, you know, there's really not a whole lot happening. I'm going to go through the effects processing that we have on the, the chords of melody group and the individual tracks. On the actual group itself, there is no effects processing. The first channel is, is only MIDI and it's not present. The second uh, individual track is called Chords. And in that track, we have an EQ8, we have two side chain compressions going on, and we have an audio effects rack uh, with a macro being automated. As you can see the EQ8, we have a big roll off in the low end. We have a little boost at around 1K, 1 kilohertz. And then to, to get the, um, in this, the chords to sound uh, present, we, did a, we have a, a high shelf at uh, 3, uh, 
1017 hertz uh, with a gain of 6.9. I'm going to play through the um, a loop of our, of our chords, soloed, and I'll show you just how this does add presence. Uh, the gain, as I take the gain down, the sound is going to move away from us. As I move the game back up, it comes back. We have two side chains. Uh, we have, it's being side chained by the ghost kick, and it's being side chained by the drums. The audio effects rack is is um, the audio effects rack is doing the exact same as uh, we had showed in the guitar lead. So if you go back down to the uh, chords. Uh, and look at the automation drawn in. Actually, this is a good thing I just did. I clicked that and that actually turned the automation off. Uh, to turn it back on, you have to right click and it, you go up to re-enable automation. And you, that can happen a lot during your during your uh, mixing. I'm gonna push, put this down the, um, put it, the, this is in the automation lane, but we basically did the exact same uh, effect. Uh, this was recorded in uh, using the audio effect rack and setting up a macro. Next we have the strings. The strings has a similar sidechain compression and it has its own uh, unique EQ8 that, uh, that is rolling off the lows for our sub and our sub kick. And a little boost in the around 500 hertz and we have another uh, high shelf uh, giving the sound, making the sound a little bit more present. Third we have the pluck. On the pluck uh, we have the same audio effect Rack uh, withdrawn in automation, or this is record. This is recording automation, and then that's drawn in automation. We also have side chaining uh, with the ghosts kick and the drums. We have a saturator, and we're using a. This is called warm up the lows, and it is a preset. And to set to to change this preset, if we press this this button here, it turns orange and actually highlights the preset that we used under saturator. So, uh, we use the warm up the lows. And I, could, I guess I could show you how we switch. If you switch, if you press, if you click, double click on warm up the highs, it's gonna. You just saw it changed to warm up the highs. And I'm gonna put it back to the one that we used. Back, double click, warm up the lows. Take that off. Click that orange button. What I didn't talk about a few minutes ago is that these tracks, these strings, um, they're not exactly. They've got slow attack times, and what that means is the attack, if you're not used to this, if you have a fast attack, then once a sound starts playing, you hear the sound right away. But if it has a slow attack, it kind of ramps up in volume, then as soon as the, the trigger, the sample is triggered, or the clip is played, or whatever, you don't necessarily hear it at full volume right away. It takes a fraction of a second to build up to full volume. And that's very, very common with strings. Strings being kind of the classic thing that is a good demonstration of a very, very slow attack. So I'm going to actually play... Um, let's see, what's the best way to do this? Let's, um, let's solo the group and I'm going to turn off everything except for the pluck, and I'm going to turn the metronome on for a second, so you can kind of hear where the beat is supposed to be. So let's play through a little bit of the pluck section. Okay, and to me that sounds very much like it's in time with the beat. Now, if instead, if I turn on the string section and play that uh, metronome along with it, let's see what happens. Okay, to me that's still pretty obvious that it almost sounds... I'm going to turn it up again, turn, turn the speaker volume up. It almost sounds like the metronome is coming in ahead too fast compared to the sample of the strings. And that's not technically what's happening. The metronome is on time, it's the strings that are late. Okay, so listen to that once again and see if it feels intuitively like the metronome's ahead of the beat. See, it sounds just a tiny bit rushed. And to be honest, what happened was we had to put a delay 
on this. Now these delay things, basically what happens is normally a delay is positive. And if you've got a positive number of milliseconds there, then once a sample is supposed to start playing, it doesn't start playing for that number of milliseconds. Okay, so 22 milliseconds, you know, in terms of absolute time for a person, that's not much time. That's 22 one thousandths of a second, which is a fraction of a second. So to delay something, if this was a positive number, so let's put it up to the positive numbers. If, um, if you were to delay this by 22 one hundredths of a second, then let's see what it sounds like. See, it sounds terrible timing. Um, but in terms of music production, 22 milliseconds is a pretty, is a fairly significant amount. Now, we don't want to delay stuff. What would happen would be if you've got some sort of sample that's coming down ahead of the beat too early, then by adding a positive delay, you slow it down for making, making a sound, and so you might slow it down enough so it's actually happening on the beat instead of ahead of the beat. But in this case, with the strings having a slow attack, we wanted a negative amount of delay. So it's kind of like an advance. And so essentially this negative delay of 22 seconds, which, you know, maybe it should be faster, maybe it should be like 27, that speeds it up and makes it come in closer to the beat where it's, it's supposed to sound. And to be clear, if I've got this at negative 27, the clip is actually being triggered. It's starting technically ahead of the beat, 27 milliseconds ahead of the beat. It just doesn't sound like it's starting that far ahead of the beat because it takes so long to, to make noise. Okay, so that's why we have these delays over here. And this is the first time that we've used delays on this track. And you can see that the delay on the pluck is only three one thousandths of a second of uh, lead time. So very, very minor. Anyway, it's something that you won't use that often, but uh, I, it was kind of important on the strings in this particular track. Okay, I'm gonna look at the pads and effects together. And so for pads, we have one group, the pads group. Within that, we have a pad track, an individual track, just a single track. And on the pads track, let's see what it sounds like. Uh, and we will use this section right here. Turn off the metronome. And I'm gonna have to turn this up on my speakers. Okay, so very, very consistent background sound, not doing a whole lot. And this kind of a pad, you have to be careful because this can kind of clash with other frequencies in some of your, your lower mid-range stuff. And, and mid-mid-range too. So looking at what's being automated on the mixer, the track volume, we have this cutting in and out at times. You know, for example, right here. Then all of a sudden it drops down in volume significantly to almost minus 15 decibels going into the break instead of minus three decibels. Uh, but the other stuff that's being automated is on the audio effects rack, which Fran will talk about in a few minutes. Okay, so that's the pads. Now looking at the effects, the effects is a little bit more confusing uh, because our effects grouping has six separate, oh sorry, seven separate tracks within it. And a couple of these that I've got downsized are downsized because there's nothing in them at the moment. And maybe there is, maybe there's clips sitting them in session view over here, but uh, as far as the arrangement that we're working on right now, there's nothing playing. So really only four of our effects tracks are doing anything. And so going from top to bottom, let's, uh, let's solo this one first. And we will play, and this is gonna sound kind of like a, almost like an explosion. Or a gunshot, okay? So that's pretty simple. Uh, the second one is this repeating pattern, FX noise. And then our third one, 
FX Noise 1 is uh, kind of similar. A little bit high pitched compared to the other. Basically some white noise and reverb and stuff. And then the one that really stands out for people listening to this would be the um, our swells and our, our fade outs. Okay, and that one cut out before the beginning of the first bar of part A, and that's on purpose. That was to give a bit of a pause before everything hits at the beginning of part A. So let's turn everything on and just pay attention to this part right here as I play through it. <laughs> Okay, and if you move over, we also have some of these where they are back to back and reversed. And so soloing that. Oh, sorry. Okay, so it fades in and out. And then if you put that in context with the track as a whole, it's really hard to hear it with everything else there. Okay, now what about uh, listening to all of the effects together? Um, well, there's not a whole lot of times when everything's playing together, but quite often there's two or three parts. Okay, so just some background stuff there. Okay, so, you know, the sound effects very, taken by themselves, they don't sound really that impressive, but they add so much to a track once they're in the background and complementing all the other uh, all the other instruments. And so basically, um, there's not a whole lot of them happening in the really thick parts, part A, or verses, which is where there's a lot of other more predominant stuff happening. We don't have a whole lot of special effects happening just because they're basically, they're covered up by the noise of the rest of the track. And the same thing with part B here, you know, that's a high energy section and you can see there's not a whole lot happening within this section in terms of effects. But then when you get to the quieter areas, the two breaks, the outro, that's when the special effects really start to shine through. So I guess I'll let uh, Fran talk a little bit more about the effects chains on those special effects. There's not a lot I can add there, but I'm going to talk about the effects on the group and the individual tracks for our pads and our effects. On the pads themselves, we do have our sidechain compression going on. Uh, both the, the sidechained uh, ghost kick and the drums. On the pad itself, there is an audio effects rack and a, we're automating the macro. That's very similar to what we did in um, the guitar and, and, the, and in parts of the chords. But in this case, um, this was all drawn in it was all penciled in or drawn and I, I just clicked on, I, actually when you move it is what happens, I'm going to go re-enable automation and show you what happens. It's actually when you move the macro that it, it'll be, it, it turns black on my screen, it looks more like a grey here um, and that means it's shut off so if I play the track that the effects that are there won't actually be playing so you have to, you have to right click on it and then go up here and it says re-enable automation so you click on that, boom, red's back. Now moving on to the effects, there's actually nothing on the group stage. The first impact that we have, we don't have any processing on it. Um, the second FX noise, I think has a lot going on. I'm gonna loop it. Solo it. And I'm gonna let it play through. And I'm gonna show you, um, I'm probably gonna let it play through. And I'm gonna turn everything off and then turn it on and show you, show you what each uh, effect is actually doing. I'm going to turn your speaker volume up a little here. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Uh, the, first, uh, the first effect in the chain is a simple delay. 
and that's set up to kind of create a, a, a spread in the stereo sound so it makes the sound move sound wider in the speakers second we have a reverb second we have a reverb uh, that it creates um, more space in the sound that's what it what the reverb does and then we have the EQ8 and we have we have it rolled off a lot because we're just looking more for that higher sound and Getting rid of this actually helps the overall mix. Um, getting rid of those lows, rolling off all those lows with a high pass filter is really helping. It really helps uh, the mix overall. It won't, uh, it won't be as muddy in those frequencies. I'm gonna come in Z, or Control Z, sorry, and to put it back to where we had it. The limiter is adding volume. Uh, it's, it's not actually limiting at this point because uh, if you look right here, this is the level showing the limiter actually kicking in and it'll be a yellow, uh, I, well, I'll demonstrate what happens. As I turn this up, now it's it's orange actually. It's 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 starting to limit now. Control Z, put it back. Uh, next, we have a saturator, which adds a little. We have the drive up a little bit, so that adds a little bit of harmonic distortion or distortion. Utility is bringing the sound back down. And last, we have a, com a compressor, which is adding a little bit more to this to the sound. And you can turn the whole the whole effects chain off. Um, just by clicking the first on off button that turns off everything at once and if you double click on it it actually closes it okay next we have the FX noise 1 very similar sound it's a lot higher uh, we, have, we, have an, uh, we do have another audio effects uh, rack with a reverb a multi-band an EQ8 and a utility. The multiband is, is actually is actually um, compressing the, the sound, uh, but it, it actually does it through f uh, f frequencies. So we have a low set at 120. Uh, we have a mid, which would be between the low, which is 120, and the high of 10. And it's acting on those individual bands. Uh, it's compressing those individual bands. Uh, we do have a reverb on it. It's a ton of reverb, so it gives it a really washed out sound. Turn that off, it's a big difference. And we have an EQ8, we do have that one really rolled off too, and we're only using most of the high, the high sounds. And this utility is actually putting the, the sound in a, in a, it has a width of 88%, which means it's a little bit more mono than, than the other sound, which would be at 100%. Uh, I guess the big thing about the vocals effects and the pads is they are background and um, you, you don't really notice them until they're not there. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna play them and turn them off. Play them with the whole track. Um, may as well go to part. I'm gonna go to part A where everything's kind of going. Well, actually, no. I'm gonna go to the break. I'm gonna go to the break because that has most of the, most of the effects and the, the pattern going on at that point. Take off the solo. So it's more when I take the pad out and take the uh, effects out that you're gonna really notice it. Now the track, it, I mean, it has the main sounds, but it does sound empty. That's, and these, these actually supply support to the rest of the sounds, what they do. That's it. Can you show them also what, um, if you open one of the clips, let's go into the pad section there and open up one of these clips. Show them how we use the um, bits and pieces of a, um, we basically duplicated okay. a clip there, and how you can also loop them. Okay. Uh, right now, it's actually this one shouldn't be too hard to do it on. Uh, right now, we what we did is we duplicated it. I'm guessing eight times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and it's a it's a two bar, uh, it's a two bar loop. So what you do to, to actually you can loop it so that it's actually looks like it's only uh, one. It is only one clip. So you go into here under sample, and you click on loop. And then what you do is you go up to the first, the first uh, audio clip, and you when you go on the edge there, it makes a little. I'm not sure what you call that. What would you call that? Uh, like when you go on the end, like I go on the end there, and I go on the end there. I don't know. It's just the end, end of the clip. Okay, you, it's you, you, you the drag, end of the clip. You drag and extend the clip. Okay, yes. So as I drag and extend it, it's actually repeating the loop, and you can see the little loop points. It is one clip, but it does show you all the little loop points uh, right there at the top. And so the way that we had done it before, it was just the two bar, if you want to control Z that, the way that we had done it before 
was that if you had just this one clip, like say we've got it out here, if that's highlighted and you hit Control D on a PC, it just keeps making duplicates. And so the only difference really is that in this case, all of these are um, separate individual small clips instead of one that's been spread out and looped on itself. Okay, we need to look at the vocals next. And this section's a little interesting because we had not intended to have vocals in this track at the start. It was built as an instrumental for the tutorial. And then sort of at the last minute before we started filming, we realized, well, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to have some vocals in there, um, just to demonstrate a bit of what can be done with the track, and also to give you something to experiment with. But we didn't have time to write up lyrics and find a good vocalist and record everything. So what I did was I quickly took a laptop and a microphone over to a friend's place, Kelly, and I got her to read a few lines that were from an ancient Chinese text, translated to English, of course. And so if you go into the um, session view and look at the vocals, if you zoom in on this, you can actually see that there's five different samples here. The flame that burns, uh, the mystical techniques, kindness in words. Anyway, these five different clips, I only used two of them in the track in the end, but the others are there. So if you do want to experiment with them, please go ahead. Um, and what we have, we have a vocals group, and within the group we have two tracks. And we didn't really want to have something very conventional and static. We thought, well, let's experiment a little bit and try and kind come up with something that's really evolving and unique and different. So what we have, the vocals track, is copies of the original vocal samples that I showed you in session view a minute ago. And if I go into one of these, and let's say I take off all of the effects, and I'm just going to play that by itself with no effects. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. From caring comes courage. Okay, so a very plain, straightforward, well-recorded, uh, vocal clip, spoken word. And we added a ton of effects to this. And so basically, I have reverb, I have delay, I have EQing, and I have a utility. So let's play, um, let's play this clip, we'll put it on loop, I will play it over and over, and I'll show you the different effects that are on the track one at a time, so you can see what they do by themselves. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. So the, the reverb amount twice as bright is quite heavy, and so it's really giving it quite a bit of a wash out. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. And then for the, the delay, that burns twice it's as going to give you quite an echo. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. Okay, so that's the pretty straightforward. And then the EQ8 really, really cuts away the low end in her voice and sharpens up the uh, the frequencies that I wanted to cut through. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. Okay, so a big difference there. And then the utility, to be honest, wasn't doing a whole lot. So let's let's put these um, all of them into context together and see what happens. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. From caring comes courage. Flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. From caring comes courage. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. From caring comes courage. Now this is this is interesting because I've got so much automation here, and this is a good example of what you can do with automation. And a lot of people are scared of automation, and I was when I started, but it's so simple. It's basically imagine yourself in kindergarten drawing with a crayon, because that's all you're doing. You're just drawing uh, different values on the track to make the parameters go up and down, make the volume knobs, make all the levers and stuff on your effects go up and down. So if you look at the reverb, then the reverb I've automated the dry wet, and you can see it jumps up and down a bit, especially here it's a lot less, then it jumps back up, and then we have a big boost near the end. 
If you look at the delay, dry wet, it's down most of the time, although there's a bit of a climb right there. Because I really wanted those things to stand out. Those those last couple echoes near the second uh, last last two beats of the first half of the phrase. And then for the uh, last thing, the mixer, track panning, I'm going back and forth. So basically about every two bars roughly, it is jumping back and forth. And I'm not going all the way to the outsides of the speakers. I'm going about halfway, you know, 26. Um, so I'm going from center halfway out to one side, then back in, and then halfway out to the other side, back and forth. So the other track, let's look at this one. This one basically took one of the vocal samples and Fran took it and sliced it up and put it into an instrument. And now the, the different little slices that are part of that overall sample, they're played in order, but they're, they're triggered by MIDI notes. And so we'll show you this in a minute. But essentially, if you look at it, each one of these little dark dots is one of the MIDI notes in that slice. And so as I play through it, if I solo it, you're going to be hearing what's happening here. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. The flame now you can hear that it's not uh, a nice clean sample anymore. It's, it's a bit warbly and it's got audio artifacts. And for a lot of, uh, lot of production cases, experiments, uh, tracks, that's a bad thing because some people don't want to hear that. But for our track, based on the style of the track and what we were trying to accomplish with the vocals, it's very appropriate, it's very glitchy. We wanted something that was kind of weird and offbeat. And so, so what's happening is the neat thing about this, if we had wanted to, we could rearrange the notes and instead of ramping up in order, then if, if we rearrange them, the different words in that sample, different parts of words, would play in a different order. So that's kind of neat. We didn't get into that, but really all you would have to do is start changing the MIDI notes in this clip to make that happen. Now, the other thing that's interesting is on this MIDI clip, we have automated the MIDI control and we have automated the pitch bend parameter. And the way that this works, anything in the center between the top and bottom is unaffected. And so that line across there, if that's where my automation was, there would be no pitch bending happening. But anytime the pitch bend is below the middle line, the pitch bend goes down and makes the voice deeper. Anytime it's above, the pitch goes up and makes it higher pitched. So you can see we have automation going through this clip that's slowly ramping it up and slowly increasing the pitch of the MIDI slices. So let me just play a couple places during this clip to show what I mean. The bright burns half as long. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. Okay, so you can see how that's changing. And if I had put some automation points here and here and here, I could have it actually go to a voice deeper than the original recording. Half as long. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. The flame that burns. Okay, so that's interesting what you can do with that. Now, another thing that's interesting is that we have automation here in the clip. And we haven't shown you this before in this project. Normally, all of our automation is happening up here on the tracks. And that's fine. You can do it that way. There's all kinds of automation possibilities. But something neat, if you want to, you can put your automation for something on the clip itself. And there's pros and cons to doing it this way or that way. I'm not going to get into that because it's kind of a long separate tutorial. But uh, short version either works, so do whatever you feel like. I like using the track automation more frequently when I'm arranging a song. I sometimes do automation 
you know, say that I had a single clip that I wanted to put a whole bunch of automation points on that one clip, and I wanted that clip to show up 14 different places in my track, it may be way faster instead of trying to do all those automation points 14 separate, separate times along the track. It may be easier to take that clip and put your automation in the clip and just copy that clip so you've got 14 copies. So, so that's the reason why clip automation can be useful. One reason. I'm going to show how we took the audio vocals here and actually um, turn them in, slice them to MIDI. I guess the big thing with, I think, with audio vocals and vocals in general, especially in modern dance music, is just experiment, 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 and you're going to come up with some cool things. I'm going to show you a, a little bit what we did. Um, so we're going to click on this, on this audio clip. You need a warp on to slice it to MIDI. So we're going to, the warp button is in the sample area. And when I press that, it turns yellow. And now it's warp is on. And now what you do is you right click. And as you go down, you should, you should see a slice to new MIDI track. And there it is there, right below crop clips. And that doesn't show up if you don't have warp on, right? No, warp has to be on. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to click on that and it's, it's not going to slice right away. It's going to give me settings. And I'm pretty sure we did, I usually do like using eighth notes too, and I think that's what we use. So I'm just going to press uh, OK, and it should give us um, maybe, well, we'll see, 16, up to 16. It is, we're getting 16 slices. And it created, as right below it actually, it created a, a new uh, track, and this is the slice MIDI tracks. So I'm just going to go to that track right now and um, solo it, take the record off. I'm going to loop it so we can hear it. And it should repeat the same sound that we heard in the audio clip. The flame that burns twice as bright burns and half as long. I'm gonna the flame expand that burns this twice as bright burns so we can see all the clips. The flame that and there's burns some twice interesting things in this that we can do to to change the it up. Um, and and you can hear that that's a pretty clean sound compared to what I was showing you a minute ago. Burns twice and it's because there's less audio artifacts. Um, when you first slice it, some of those audio, audio artifacts that I showed you were a result of other stuff that we were doing. And I think one cool thing you can do is um, if you click on the headphones here, you can actually hear each, uh, each sample. There's nothing. Okay, there's, well, there's nothing in that sample. This is how you come up with cool glitchy stuff as you repeat this kind of stuff. So we can do some hat, stuff here too hat. to make it sound different, sound cool. Actually, it's just little editing things. The flame that burns um, twice as bright. Burns there's buttons half in as the long. under notes here, the flame that burns and twice it, as there's a reverse and an inverse. Half. And I think in this case, the reverse and inverse, bright, just because if we're doing them all at the same time, I think it's going to do the same thing. But it's going to make this, bright, it's going to reverse the clips and it's going to play the vocals the backwards. So that's not that interesting to do. I'm going to try inverse two because I think in this case it's going to be the same thing though. Yeah. And that's interesting because we can show you another type of reversing a clip and the two of them are totally different. This one is taking those 16 pieces, it's playing each of the 16 pieces in reverse order, but each piece, which is 1 16th of the phrase, is still playing forward, the same direction it was recorded, okay? The other way is to take the original audio clip and reverse that, in which case the whole clip is being played backwards. It does sound different. It's a very Not different sound. It. Yep. I'm going to show also above the reverse and inverse, there's a divide by two and a multiply by two, and that's going to make the clips come either twice as fast or we're going to make the clips go twice as slow. So we're going to go twice as fast first and see what that sounds like. It's, it's actually looped, so we're going to press, I'm going to press the space bar and it should sound a lot different. It's happening twice as fast. I'm going to put loop on and you can keep dividing it smaller. Actually, I'm going to... So I mean, that's exper you can experiment like that. And then now... The flame that burns twice as... In this case, I don't have long... The flame that... The flame that... The flame burns twice as... So I'm going to put that back as it is. But you can do a lot of experimenting. And, and Bloody was saying earlier, you can change uh, change the these around. And that's how you, that's the creativity that, that twice you should be doing to try to come up with your own unique... Um, as, yeah. The flame, let's let's do a quick, pattern. quick demonstration of that. If we were to go and... Uh, 
Uh, sorry. Come on, Command Z. Yeah, come on, Command Z. That. Okay, if we were to Control Z. Do this, and then which one was the? Okay, so let's um, let's take this. You have to stretch that. Okay, so let's take this note and copy it, and then put it up here, and make a whole bunch of them. Yeah, you're gonna get a glitch, glitchy sound. Okay, and then we'll get rid of these. And then let's see what happens when we play it. Burns twice as. She's gotta extend. The flame that burns twice as. She's up here in the. The flame that burns twice as bright burns long. Okay, so that didn't really sound great because Blah. it was too fast. Blah. So what if we cut Blah. these out? Blah. Okay, Blah. it's still too much. Okay, you know, that's not a perfect example. And I guess one reason is we have it at 130 second notes. Yeah. And you can, if you, it's something that we can just show them. Uh, if you right click on it, you can actually change the fixed grid here, which we, we had done up in this session, or in the arrangement, sorry, but you can actually change the grid here. And, and that's why it was so fast, because we had it on 30 seconds. But you could make it eighth notes, and it would be it would be yeah. all zero. Zero shuts it off. Yeah. We'll play it again. The flame that burns This twice might be too bright, slow, I don't know. Well, it's, you're getting a glitch effect. The flame that burns twice as bright. Burn. Yeah, and you can also, you know, you could burn. rearrange four or five flame of these things. Bright, burn. So the flame uh, experiment. Do lots of experimenting. Okay, let's try that. Okay, so you can really make some cool yeah. stuff with that if you play around with it for a while. So, I mean, that's exactly how we made the MIDI that we did make, and we just uh, looped it. Let's show you how to reverse the audio instead of using slices. I'm gonna loop, it's looped right now. I'm gonna play it. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as I'll play it with the effects and without the effects. The so I'm gonna go in. You actually don't have to have it looped here. But in the sample area, there is a reverse button. And when I press that, it will reverse the, it will reverse the sample. <laughs> I guess I'll try it without. It sounds cool with the sample. Uh, it does sound cool with all this on anyway. The flame twice as bright burns half as long. I'll do it dry. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as So it's a reverse button here in the sample. The flame And in this area too, you guys will talk about it. You can actually, um, if you switch from transients, if you, sorry, if you switch from beat to complex, you can actually use a transpose here and actually transpose it up 12 or down 12, but I'm, I'm just going to use 12. So we're changing the pitch, so you can come up with some... And then we can make it really deep. And this does it, this is a... This does it in smaller um, versions. Like that's semitones. This is CT. Uh, well, 100 CT would be one. No, actually. Oh, centitones. Centitones, yeah. It's a hundredth of a tone. Okay. Oh, yeah. 50. Every 50 is a, is a semitone. 50 of these is a semitone. So that's another way of doing it. Apparently there's back. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. Yep, so lots of possibilities there. Okay, so that's it for chords, melody, pads, vocals, and effects. Uh, that's enough for this video. And so the last video in the series coming up is going to talk about the master channel. It's going to talk about the send returns, and that should give you kind of the, uh, the final overview perspective of the rest of the project that you need to really uh, understand how we put this together. Okay, I'm going to put a link to the next video in the series on the screen in just a minute, which you will only see if you're not on a mobile device. Uh, otherwise, the link's in the text description underneath this video. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next section.